Cliff became famous for making crucible history in his match against Terry Griffiths in 83. There's something magical about uh, ultimates in any sport, aren't there? Couldn't possibly wish to have the balls in a better position than this. Now, the first one for seven in the World Championships is very, very special. In fact, I had a dream about two weeks before that, you know, that I was going to make a 147 round. I remember he flipped the red. I missed it. Well, a simple shot, really. Misses the red and the bottom pocket. Hits the jaws. Went across the top. And struck a ball that was uh, a foot from the pocket. Knocked it in. One. Staying on the black as well. My word, that's a bonus. And he just kept going and going. And we'd never seen this, and I thought, is he going to do it? I knew after I made the second or third black, you know, they had a chance to make a 147. It wasn't very good, right? Watching someone do a 147 when your eyes break yourself up to that point was 18. Fifteen reds later, he was still on the black. God, he's going to do it. I wasn't really that nervous. Uh, I, you know, I couldn't feel any nerves, really. Tough shot, but that's 15 reds and 15 blacks that he's taken now. I was uh, on the yellow ball and I was uh, all set to shoot. They stopped play on the other table. Bill Werbenach stuck his head around the corner. There's just this little head like Mr. Chad. And it's very difficult not to see Bill Werbenach when he puts his head around the corner. Was he actually around there chain him on or was he mind sweeping? Just after nicking drinks, you know, because he's thinking if you don't put a 147 break, you're not going to have your eye on your pint of mild, are you? I'm thinking to myself, not now, Bill, you know. Get out of the way, you know, and it was all that. My brother rang someone else's house to tell them that they had to put the snooker on because, you know what I mean, it looked like he was, he was going to make this 147 break. Well, the green and the brown and uh, rolled the blue on the side and then I realised that the pink wasn't on the spot. I mean, just like so wrapped up. It was almost like I was every spectator in the place. Well, I don't think there's going to be another moment in Cliff's life when he's going to be so tense as this. On the black, I can't tell you how good I felt on that. I just wanted to make sure that, I, uh, that the black never even touched the job. Jack Carnham was doing the commentary. And Jack, in my mind, issued the best line of commentary ever issued by a snooker commentator. Oh, good luck, mate. Perfect. And the black went down. Straight in. Oh, wonderful! He immediately sinks to his knee. The guy's, yeah! The arms in the air, everybody rushing in. Terry's come up, Bill's come uh, hurtling round the corner, you know. Bill came round and he went to put his arms round this, and you're not going to tell him no, are you? You know, I put my arms around both of them and I, you know, just, you know, banged my head for it. And I actually, you know, gave him a real good headbutt each. Then a great big hug and everything, and the whole of Crucible seemed to stop. I was in doing uh, grocery shopping over the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, Cliff Thorburn has just made a per the first perfect game in the World Championship. I went out back and uh, this young lad asked me for my autograph and I couldn't even sign my name. My hand was just flopping around like a seal. 18,000 quid and good luck there. Come on, but there were other ways for snooker players to line a pocket than with a well-judged red. International stardom and nice little learners were the order of the day. We had ten years of actually a circus of going round almost WWF style and everyone became very famous in their own right. And we ended up everywhere from Sao Paulo in Brazil, Hong Kong, Dallas in America, India, Tokyo in Japan, Australia. China wanted a, a snooker exhibition, snooker matches. Off you go to China. We did the first show ever in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. And Barry Hearn was keen to find out how many might watch on television because we had this great audience of 18 and a half million that watched our final. And the fella said, well, you'll probably get somewhere between 150 and 200 million. 
Jimmy White even chalked up a co-starring role in the film Legend of the Dragon, unaccountably overlooked by the Academy Awards. We had done it in a big leisure centre, and they're all sort of gangster-type Chinese guys. It was good, it was a great film. In one of the shots, he jumped off a springboard, he went about 20 foot in the air. come down and done a massage shot. Well, that's got to be a foul shot, four away, an opponent's ball anywhere in the D, surely. <laughs> Don't applaud, Jimmy. Well, while some were enjoying the ka factor and foreign frolics of the snooker boom, the game's original self-styled superstar was heading for self-destruction. Controversial, temperamental, but a terrific talent for the game of snooker. One of the most talented players. His lifestyle was disgraceful. Drinking, gambling, womanising, you name it. We've all nipped behind a bush when we're caught short, but not at the crucible. He was guilty of urination in the flower arrangement. And I don't think it did any harm to anybody, just the fact that he got caught was the thing, wasn't it? I imagine he pissed in people's drinks just for the giggle, just to keep it lively. But Alex's clowning was becoming less and less funny. Police officers interviewed the snooker player Alex Hurricane Higgins today about an allegation that he head-butted a competition official. I'm positive he, he wasn't aware that he was actually in the middle of some snooker tournament. He, he, he just thought someone was looking at his lass. Paul Hatherall, director of the UK Championships, says he was head-butted and verbally abused. Alex dropped his pint, grabbed his tie and head-butted him at the side of the head, split his eye wide open. And the ideal thing is that I turn around and have to wait the outcome. Oh, my God, sorry, gosh. <laughs> Alex. He got about a £2,000 fine and he was banned for five tournaments the next season. I've had run-ins with that particular person for about five or six years. Are you sorry? I'm sorry, yes, of course I'm sorry. But there was a lot more trouble to come. Alex was in the Irish world team with Dennis Taylor. He just, just lost it completely and um, said things that he probably didn't mean to say. Threatened to have me shot the next time I went back home to Northern Ireland. Uh, but it wasn't so much that. He said a very personal thing about uh, a member of my family and I thought, well, you know, I'm not standing for that. Are you still upset about what he said? Yeah, well... <laughs> That'll take a while. Soon after, Alex and Dennis were drawn to play each other in the Irish Masters. I was determined I wasn't going to lose that match. I'll never forget standing in the dressing room, looking at the mirror and, and just talking to myself and shouting at myself, saying, you can't lose, you can't lose. He played some really flamboyant shots where he could have just potted the, the pink and finished the frame. He not only played to the crowd, it was a little bit, he wanted to really rub your nose in it. He wanted to humiliate you. you know, I wanted to win for so many reasons, and sure enough, I, I beat Alex 5-2. Alex Higgins concedes and shakes hands with Dennis Taylor. That was just a, a little bit of revenge. Defeat in the first round of the World Championships by Steve James in 1990 left Alex with sorrows even he couldn't drown. Came down to the press conference and Colin Randall, who was a press officer, said to him, thanks for coming down, Alex. And with that, Alex punched him in the stomach. No reason whatsoever. This game is the most corrupt game in the world. And you get absolute tosses, doing jobs for exorb exorbitant money. Well, I don't really want to be part of that. So you can shove your snooker up your taxi. I'm not playing no more. Shocked and excited because it was in his blood, you know. I'm wondering, did he really mean it? Or would he come back and carry on again? So I would like to announce my retirement from professional struggle. For that and the Dennis Taylor crime, he was banned for a year and stripped of all his ranking points. 
I'm disappointed, but uh, I'll just have to take it like a man. Which effectively um, meant that he was back to square one and could never get back into the top part of the game again. So when he came back, he had to go right back to round one qualifying against a new breed of player that was coming through in the 90s. Um, and he couldn't do it. So was the glass half empty or half full? Was the hurricane a tragic drunk or the man who transformed snooker? My brother made snooker. I don't think it would ever came to the height that it did get to, unless he had been in it.